All right, uh, let's see. Let's continue where we left off. We're in uh, chapter 23. Um, Esther enolates and the Clays and Condensation. We were moving along, and we're on topic number six. <coughs> Beta dicarbonyls. as um, synthetic intermediates. And what we, the, re the main reaction we, we covered last time was um, called the acetoacetic ester synthesis. Acetoacetic, acetoacetic ester synthesis. And it's a method to make methyl ketones. Substituted methyl ketones. So you can make your methyl ketone with two R groups, R and R prime, right? And what we saw, and I'm not gonna repeat the whole thing, is that you can start with this stuff called methyl, methyl, methyl acetoacetate, methyl, acetoacetate <clears throat> and do a reaction with a base usually NaOET or in this case we'd use NaOME because you have a methyl ester if you have an ethyl ester you'd use NaOET okay R Rx base again and R prime X and you <clears throat> lit up the molecule with R groups and then what we saw was we could uh, treat this with acid and that would do a acid catalyzed ester hydrolysis H plus cat ester hydrolysis And then we would just rotate around the carboxylic acid. So this is a reactive intermediate. Rotate it around and then this oxygen grabs a proton, lose, car lose carbon dioxide. Actually, it's not. It's not reversible. It's irreversible. And this is tautomerize to the final product. Okay, so that's what we saw last time. Let's quickly go over the mechanism of the ester hydrolysis. Actually, I'll, I'll just abbreviate it because you guys should know this pretty well. I'm using ethyl ester in this case. Okay, so yeah, it's essentially protonate the ester. You make an RSCC, water attacks it, you get to a point that looks like this, roughly. And then you proton transfer, on, proton transfer onto the ethyl, ethoxy. Right. 
And then oxygen kicks off. Kicks off the ethyl. And then you lose a proton. And you get the product. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, so that's, yeah, ester hydrolysis. It's the opposite of Fischer esterification. And you should know that mechanism pretty well. Draw it out if you need to review it a bit. Okay. Um, if we were using this reaction, this aceto acetic ester synthesis, to make a product like, we'll say, uh, I don't know. To make this methyl ketone, how would you go about that? Well, it's really easy. You just what you got to do is envision where the disconnections are. Put a little squiggly lines there. There's a disconnection of a benzyl CH2 phenyl, and also an isobutyl group. Okay, and um, then it's just a matter of start the synthesis using this reagent and then it's just one base two base four <clears throat> and so uh, you just pick it, throw in the um, the reagents the uh, alkyl halides that we've identified up here right so maybe in it, the order doesn't really matter so that's benzyl bromide Phenyl CH2 Br, and then we have isobutyl bromide. Okay, and then heat in the presence of acid, H3O plus heat. There's that whole mechanism of ester hydrolysis and decarboxylation. And you get it. It's your final product. Okay? Yeah. Let's see one more example. Let's consider how would you make this interesting methyl ketone? Um, remember the cleavage points are between the alpha carbon and the beta carbons, so it's there and there. And so the way you, the way you synthesize this kind of um, cyclohexane uh, methyl ketone thing. Uh, would be start with the same stuff methyl or ethyl your choice but the, the trick here now is you use the same base and rather than um, I mean some people would um, uh, do this And that's actually wrong because you see where the squiggly line is supposed to be. It's it's between um, well, you're supposed to disconnect a carbon chain. That's one, two, three, four, a five carbon carbon chain. Now we're doing a six carbon carbon chain. So this would actually give you a totally different molecule. It would give you that, and then you would hydrolyze off the ester and lose CO2, right? And lose CO2. What's the name of the reaction where CO2 is lost? It's called decarboxylation. Decarboxylation, okay? And it's one word, decarboxylation. And anyway, your, your end product after all of this would be not exactly what you want because what we want is cyclohexane and then a ketone 
Uh, here we have an extra carbon, so this is yeah, this is not what we want. Undesired. Okay. So how do we how do we actually do this then to make this desired product? <clears throat> Um, the trick is to use the disconnections, the little squiggly lines, and so it's going to be base. How many carbons? It's one, two, three, four, five carbon chain. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. And usually it's like base alkyl halide, base alkyl halide. The way we do it in this case is we just say excess. Use a little bit of excess base and really just call it a two-step process. We consider it a two-step process. And what we end up getting is this intermediate. And <clears throat> these are all beta keto esters, right? Beta keto ester. Okay. And then we hydrolyze. And what's that called? That's a beta keto acid. Okay, and then we had uh, decarboxylate minus CO2. And the, the mechanism was roughly just all you got to do is rotate the carboxylic acid upward. Right. That's the trick for decarboxylation is, is rotate it so the other oxygen can see the proton and then it's just grabs it like we've seen a few times and that makes an enol of your final product. What does it look like? Enol of the final ketone product. Yeah, it's just like what you wanted. I rotated it a bit, but it's it's the same, you know, the desired product we were shooting to make. Okay. The methyl ketone. Okay, cool. All right, so now we previewed this one uh, last time. Uh, it's called the melonic ester synthesis. <clears throat> um, this is totally analogous to the last one. The, it's analogous to the acetoacetic ester synthesis. Okay, and rather than make a methyl ketone, it makes a Substituted carboxylic acid. All right. How does it do that? How does it make a substituted carboxylic acid? It could be either monosubstituted or disubstituted, depending on how many R groups you want to add. All right. So the trick now will be to use rather than a beta keto ester as our starting material, we're going to use a beta diester. And this stuff's called, I mean, I happen to use ethyl esters, so it's dimethyl, diethyl, diethyl malonate. Diethyl malonate's the name of that ester. Okay, and we're just going to do the same exact thing. So base, Rx, base, Rx. So what are we going to do this time? I'll do ethyl and then maybe benzyl. Okay. And that just attaches those two things at the alpha position, the highly acidic spot. All 
All right. What base? Probably the conjugate base of, uh, or the uh, whatever the leaving group is. So it's ethyl. We're going to use NaOET. Okay, that'll be our base. And um, then when we uh, cook this up in a little of the acid, now we're going to lose, rather than lose one ester, like we lose, lost before, it's going to lose two esters. So we're going to lose two ethanols. We're going to make two, lose two esters. Yeah. Both esters are going to be hydrolyzed, and, and you're going to liberate two ethanol molecules. Okay, and I'm going to draw it over here. All right. So now we have this molecule. And if this was a beta diester, what's this? This is a beta diacid. And just like before, it's going to decarboxylate. And I'm going to do it the same way as before. I'm going to rotate, pick, a, pick one of the carboxylic acids to rotate. I'll rotate the right side. And we're not really doing a reaction. So you can use an arrow or just an equal sign. Dot, 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 dot. Carboxylic acid is talking to the other carboxylic acid. Grab the proton, and away goes CO2. And we're left, and the CO2 is lost on the right side. And the left side, uh, whoops, looks like the enol of a carboxylic acid. the enol of a carboxylic acid, okay? And it tautomerizes through proton transfer from either oxygen to the carbon. I'll draw that out just because it's so easy. Kick in, and then the double bond grabs a proton from somewhere. Water or somewhere. Now you have a carboxylic acid, a protonated carboxylic acid with your ethyl and then you lose a proton. And you got your final product. All right, so that's the monic ester synthesis, an example of it. So we just, all we did was we double alkylated dimethylmalonate, diethylmalonate, to this, we went from one beta keto ester to the substituted beta keto ester. We treated it with acid, which just hydrolyzed the esters. So you make two ethanols, and then now we have a beta diacid. Rotate it so it can do the decarboxylation. Flip it up, lose CO2. Now you have a enol of a carboxylic acid, and then we uh, I, I sh we can uh, I'm happy with you just saying PT to get here. Or if you want to see what the mechanism is, it's simply one oxygen kicks down, grabs a proton, <clears throat> and then you lose a proton. You, you grab a proton, you lose a proton, which is exactly what a proton transfer is. Okay? The melonic ester synthesis. And as an example, let's make... a carboxylic acid randomly ok 
Okay. So you have to uh, envision the bonds cleaved to the alpha positions between the alpha to the beta carbons. So those are those are going to be the two R groups, CH3 and the cyclopentyl one. So now, now it's just a matter of draw the intermediate, the starting material. I use diethylmalonate, you could use dimethylmalonate. Four steps, base, and then we'll do CH3Br, or let's do iodide. Remember that methyl bromide to gas, methyl iodide to liquid. And then usually bromide's a pretty good choice in general. Okay, so this makes that hydrolyze to the beta diacid. Okay, and then decarboxylates. To get the final product. Decarboxylates to get the final product, lose CO2, and there you go. All right, it's another example of a, of a malonic ester synthesis. A malonic ester synthesis. Uh, what kind of alkyl halides can you use? And this also applies to the Acetoacetic ester synthesis. What kind of alkyl halides? Usually the best are really going to be methyl or primary. Uh, secondary is sometimes okay. We're obviously using secondary here, but sometimes those reactions are a little sluggish to do with secondary. What, what can you absolutely not use? in an SN2, because this is an SN2, right? You're making a nucleophile attacking. Um, what you cannot use ever, never, is tertiary. Never use tertiary, because you can't attack into tertiary with an SN2 reaction, okay? All right, good. We'll go back to uh, a situation we just kind of saw with acetoacetic. How about we make this carboxylic acid with a five member ring attached to it? And remember, the trick here is to disconnect there, disconnect there. And see what how how big is the connecting piece? It's one, two, three. It's going to be a four carbon dibromide or diiodide or chloride or whatever. And so let's let's make this now. Make using the mel melonic ester synthesis. I'll draw it to the right. Uh, base, and when we make these cyclic ones, I just say excess. How big, how many, how many carbons here? It's one, two, three, four. So it's kind of like uh, a little bit of excess base. We have a four carbon alpha halide. There's your cyclic uh, intermediate for the malonic ester synthesis. Hydrolyze both esters. Now you, you went from your beta diester to your beta diacid.
And then this, these things decarboxylate, just like a beta keto acid decarboxylates, a beta di acid does. I won't show the mechanism, I'll just show what the enol looks like after it decarboxylates. You just rotate it around and have a, one of the acetyl mondos grab the proton, lose CO2, and then this. Proton transfers, or, or you know, the technical word is tautomerism. Tautomerism from the enol form to the carboxylic acid form. Okay, that's cool. Another cool example of the malonic ester synthesis to make a uh, carboxylic acid with a uh, cyclic unit at the alpha position. Okay, so then a summary of those two methods that we just learned. The acetoacetic ester synthesis. Starts with a beta keto ester. And in the end you get a methyl ketone with one or two things attached at the alpha position. And the malonic ester synthesis you start with a beta diester, do the same business. And you get a carboxylic acid with two R groups at the end. All right, so those are cool um, cool reactions that are very versatile for building different things. Okay. Um, let me. I'll show one one last example. You can uh, another thing you can do, like another way to make a beta keto ester. A beta keto ester, kind of like the acetoacetic ester synthesis, is remem remember you can you can make beta keto esters with the Claisen condensation, and this is a intramolecular. Claisen. What's the name of the other name for intramolecular Claisen? It's a Diekmann. Diekmann cyclization. Okay, and remember it's roughly speaking, mechanistically, this attacks kicks this off. Okay, so that's a, a, a pseudo mechanism. It's not a exam acceptable mechanism. But yeah, alpha carbon attacks ester electrons up, electrons down, kick off the ethoxy, and you get a cyclic beta keto ester product, right? So I'll just draw it this way. Okay, so it's a cyclic beta keto ester. Ah, it kind of resembles this non-cyclic beta keto ester for the acetoacetic ester synthesis, right? Anyway, so you can imagine now like R, X, and then, uh, uh, sorry, base and then R, X, base and then R, X. Is that an easy reaction or a hard reaction? It's a very easy reaction because the pKa is so low, right? pKa of this is like 
this central position, pKa is like like 14 or something like that. It's a, it's a relatively uh, acidic position. So it's very easy to rip off that proton with a weak base, attach something, and then just like before you can do uh, ester hydrolysis minus ethanol lose CO2 and now you just made a, a cyclohexanone with an R group on it okay we learned other ways to do that right I mean what what about just take a, key, a cyclohexanone and just do LDA RX that, would that do it? That, looks pretty valid. You have a, a uh, you know, pKa is what, 20 or so? So you need a strong base like LDA. The problem though with this reaction is sometimes you get R groups on both sides uh, and sometimes it, yeah, you might get two R groups and uh, yeah, so this has some issues. It looks beautiful. It's just you know, base takes proton at attack. It's just difficult, practically speaking. The other way we learned it was how you did learn another way. When, back when we learned this and the limitations of this, we also learned that you could do like. I'm not going to draw this all out. But this did something, right? This is a, kind of an alternate approach. Secondary amine plus a ketone makes an enamine. Enamine. Enamine method. It's chapter 19 or 20 or something. Yeah. And uh, you'd make an enamine, and then it would attack your Rx and then H2O to hydrolyze the aminium. Uh, you should probably step through this all. Um, might see it on the final, actually. <laughs> so, uh, step through all of this, step through all the mechanisms. I think this might have been on some of the earlier quizzes or, you know, you, you did see this before. Uh, but this is an alternative approach. It's, it's actually pretty good. But this, what we did here is actually really easy too. The, the uh, the Diekmann is easy to accomplish. From this intermediate, this beta keto ester, it's very, very easy to alkylate a beta keto ester with, because it's a low pKa, CH, with it with a weak base, and then Rx, and now you have a substituted beta keto ester. Hydrolyze the ester, lose ethanol, and then Lucia too, and then you, you get this. So we have a couple ways of doing basically the same exact thing. Okay. Okay. All right, so next, moving on. We're done with the acetoacetic ester synthesis and malonic ester synthesis. Let's talk about the beta dicarbonyls, like a beta diketone, in the Michael reaction. Remember the Michael reaction? I'm sure you've long forgotten it. So, previously, we saw. Uh, what was a normal Michael reaction we saw before? So we saw base like NaOET makes the enolate, and then we saw, what we were doing was like we would react with a alpha beta unsaturated ketone, alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone, um, and then it would just make a new enolate, 
One enolite makes another enolite. Uh, then grab a proton from solvent or water, and then you get your final product. Looks like that, and we remember the name of a, a Michael product. Like there, there's a functional group arrangement, right? And it's a, it's a 1,5 dicarbonyl. 1,5 di carbonyl. So just like an aldol makes an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl, and a clazin makes a beta ketoester, a Michael always makes a 1,5 dicarbonyl. If you drill 1,4, you messed up. If you drill 1,6, you messed up. It's always a 1,5 dicarbonyl. And the other thing to remember, and the way we teach this, uh, the, the way you get a clean Michael without a Robinson, because Robinson is kind of like what can happen after a Michael, uh, is there's no alpha CH here. There's no alpha CH right there, because if there was an alpha CH on this side, it would continue to do Robinson, okay? All right, so, yeah. Uh, so to do uh, Michael then, with a beta dicarbonyl is basically the same exact thing. And so I'm going to uh, just show a couple examples, right? So it's the same exact thing. I'm just going to uh, use beta dicarbonyls instead. So. Uh, how about uh, beta diester? So we're using NaOET as our base. Okay, remember nomenclature also, this was called a Michael donor. This was called a Michael acceptor. So the Michael donor gets deprotonated to make an enolate, attacks the Michael acceptor, and you have this intermediate enolate, grab a proton, and you get your 1,5 dicarbonyl. Here, now we're using a, as an example, a, a beta diester as a Michael donor. And so I'm going to abbreviate the mechanism. Of course the base takes the proton and you make an enolate. But I'm just going to kind of just show without going through the full mechanism what the attachment looks like. Okay? So now the product there's also um, has to be a water step to you can always make an enolate, you have to protonate the enolate. Should always be a 1,5 dicarbonyl. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In this case, it's a beta diester on top and a ketone on the bottom. Yep, and that's the product. Okay. You can step through that mechanism if you like. And as you know, there are other beta dicarbonyl type molecules you can use as a Michael for the Michael donor thing. So you could do a beta ketoester, a beta ketoester, you could do like a dinitrile. You could do a keto nitrile. You could use a 
this stuff. It's called barbituric acid. Uh, yeah, all of these things, they have an acidic proton and they can easily do a Michael reaction on the central carbon as a nucleophile. Okay. As an example. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's, let's do one last one. It's uh, we'll do base uh, NaOET is our base, and we'll do uh, how about a different Michael acceptor? How about uh, alkene extra nitrile? Right? It's all plug and play. This is going to attack, and your final product after we do water. Of course, this carbon attacks that carbon, right? So, without a full mechanism, it just kind of, you know, after you make it nucleophilic, it attacks, pushes all the way, make, kind of makes like a nitrile enolate, I guess you'd say. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So this is also a 1,5-dicarbonyl, but it's the nitriles are acting as carbonyls. 1,5-dicarbonyl. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this is the disconnection. Okay, so yeah, uh, like I said, there's kind of a plug and play. You can use other um, Michael donors, dicarbonyl Michael donors and other uh, Michael acceptors. In this case, I did an alkene next to a nitrile. These are all Michael reactions. All right. Okay, and just like we can do beta, use beta dicarbonyls in the Michael reaction, I'm sure you can guess what our next one's going to be. Beta dicarbonyls in the Robinson. And remember the, uh, we call it Robinson reaction, but it's also called the Robinson annulation. Annulation just means ring, ring building. Okay. Previously, we saw, for example, a uh, cyclohexanone and we treat this the base. Oops. This was kind of like an uh, early example of a Robinson that we saw. Um, what are the four steps of a Robinson? The four steps were um, Michael. I just memorized this sequence. A Michael proton transfer slash reanalyze. And then intramolecular aldol. And we always end with a dehydration, loss of water. Pretty much every time you do an aldol, there's a loss of water at the end through the four step process. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to show this. You can review this if you like. Step through it, right? Do the Michael. So base takes, pro base takes proton, make an enolate, 
enolate attacks, do the mic hole. Then you have an enolate kind of hanging out on on one side, and then the proton transfer re-enolization just moves the uh, enolate from one side to the other, essentially, and then it's kind of it'll be up up here, and then you have the other ketone, and it swings down and does the intramolecular aldol. Lots of water, and you get this product. See if you can step through it. Okay. The other thing to remember, though, is that a note. There's a CH right there, and that's kind of critical to do a Robinson. Is you need, need a CH. I, I just like to say, it, and you need a CH on the other side of the Michael uh, acceptor. A CH on the other side of the Michael acceptor. Okay. All right. So they also show this same exact thing, but with a Michael. I'm sorry, with a with a beta dicarbonyl, a beta diketone. Okay. So it's essentially the same exact process. So let's try this beta diketone. And we're going to treat it with. this Michael acceptor. So this will be the Michael donor. Michael acceptor. Step, step, step. And end product is going to be this. Let's step through the, the steps, each of the steps. All right, so what's the first letter of the alphabet? It's A. Okay, so we're starting kind of with, the, with step A, which is going to be the base. It takes the proton, the central uh, highly acidic proton, to make an enolate. Okay, base takes proton to make an enolate, and now we're still kind of in step A. Which is the Michael attack, Michael reaction. So, kick electrons, make a new enolate. Alright. Now you have a ketone and a ketone and a methyl and a methyl. Uh, but we also have now a new enolate. And that new enolate is right there, right? We just made this bond. Okay. That's. Step A. Let's make my enolate a little more prominent. What does step B do? It moves the enolate from one side to the other. Okay, now you have that other enolite. I'm going to kind of go down because my sheet's a little hard to navigate. 
I'm going to do step C going downward, which is the intramolecular aldol. Right? So now this swings in, this, gra this attacks there, attacks the other ketone. That's step C. What does that give you? I'm going to show it after protonation. Like that. Okay? So yeah, there was an O minus step and then there's a protonated step. It's okay to skip that level of detail. But the big thing is after a um, aldol, what do you have? Uh, beta hydroxy ketone. Beta hydroxy ketone. And then the last step of an aldol is step, in this case, step D is irreversible. D minus H2O, which is the um, elimination of the hydroxy group. And you, you generate water, right? Minus H2O. Okay, so that was a pretty cool process that we just did. Uh, another practice problem. Good practice. Would be for you to um, make this Robinson. Make this via the Robinson. Um, let's see. I'm just going to draw it out. Okay. So this is a potential Robinson problem. Remember one, one other thing I should mention, you know, about all the all of these Robinsons and the, the intramolecular aldol you always do? What's the ring size always, 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 never exception? Six. If you do this and it looks like you made a five or a seven, you messed up. Okay? And so we, we also see a six member ring there, that's good. Um, so try this, see if you can go step D, step C, step B, step A, and make a Michael donor and a Michael acceptor and see if you can figure out what those are. See if you can do it. That's a good good challenge, right? If you can do that, you are completely set on the Robinson. to our last topic of the course. Isn't that crazy? I'm pretty sure this means we're not going to have a um, last lecture. I think this might be our last lecture. I'm sure you're so boned that we don't have another lecture. We will be having a review session though. Uh, that'll be videotaped on, on Friday and uh, It'll take a long time to process a, a two hour video, probably like four hours of computer time. But yeah, that'll be uh, useful for the final exam. Okay. Okay, so the last topic, chapter or uh, section nine, acyl anion equivalence. Acyl anion equivalence. What does this mean? I'm going to actually say very briefly. So this is a pretty cool little uh, topic. And uh, let's see, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we or not? I'm just kidding. Uh, you don't know what we're going to do, so how would you... 
be able to answer that. Is there a way if I had an aldehyde that I could just take off this proton and just rip it off? And make this kind of thing. Put some quotes around it. And could we could we do this? Make this. First of all, what would we call it? If we could make it, what would we call that thing? What we call it, it looks like it's on a carbonyl, and if it's on a carbonyl, we call it acyl. It's like, you know, we have acyl chlorides, acid chlorides, you know. This would be a acyl anion, right? It's an acyl anion. That's what we're... The name of the section is acyl anion equivalents. So this would be called an acyl anion. And can we do it? Could we do it? Is that th like a nice, stable, happy thing? And the answer is no, you cannot do that. Because of other reactions like aldols and stuff, right? That's not an acidic proton. You've never learned of that being an acidic proton. We've never said, oh yeah, just take off that acidic proton because it's not acidic. It's actually so non-acidic, it's unmeasur unmeasurable. Um, so, uh, yeah, what you would you probably get if you did this, treated this with, this with base, is you'd get an aldol reaction, right? Three plus three is six, so it's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Three plus three is six, okay? And you get this aldol product, okay? But wouldn't it be cool if you could? Wouldn't it be cool if you could do something like this? Uh, if you could do that kind of reaction, well, could, what, what are all the fun things you could do? If you if you could do it, you'd, you'd uh, take it off and you'd um, you know make an acyl ion, right? And we could, whoops. And maybe throw in a RX, all your electrophiles that you know. If you could do this, then you'd you'd uh, make ketones, for example. Wouldn't that be so fun to make ketones that way? <laughs> I don't know if you'd consider it very fun. I think it's pretty fun. Um, so what we're going to see is there's a way to kind of accomplish this, but not not through uh, deprotonating of an aldehyde, because you cannot deprotonate an aldehyde. But there are, there are things called acyl anion equivalents, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Acyl anion equivalent, which kind of accomplishes this. Okay, so, like I said, acyl anions are impossible. But we can uh, sort of uh, approximate the concept of a acyl anion. We do have acyl anion equivalents, though. Um, one example. There's a couple actually, but this is a kind of a one of the standard ones, and the, the, certainly one of the ones we teach in organic too, is what about uh, if I have this thing with two S's on it? What's that called? It was, what was it called if you had it with two oxygens? It was, it was called acetal, right? With two oxygens it's called acetal. What's it called if I have two sulfurs? thioacetal. Okay, and this is synthesized with 1,2-ethane dithiol and zinc chloride. Remember with, with the 
acetal, a normal acetal, which we also use as a protecting group, uh, you use H plus for the reaction. But with thioacetals, you using chloride. Okay, there's there's some subtle reasons for that. But anyway. It turns out that this is actually kind of an acidic proton. It's uh, pKa is uh, 31. You know, not the, not the most acidic proton in the universe, but certainly something we can uh, take off with, uh, like butyl lithium, because the conjugate acid of butyl lithium is like pKa 60. So yeah, this is a uh, like no problem for um, no problem for butyl lithium, right? So we now rip off that proton, and we have a conjugate base, and this is our acyl anion equivalent. Because it's kind of in concept, similar to to this, right? Because we can deprotect this later to back to a ketone after we do some stuff with it. So it's kind of the same concept as an acyl anion equivalent, all right? So, cool. Uh, so what can we do with it? First example, maybe a boring example, is you can just attack an RX with it. Like that. And then how do we return it back to a back to a ketone? You have to deprotect it, right? And this is going back a few chapters, but it's not totally, you know, you don't, you don't use acid water to deprotect a thioacetal. The best way is mercury chloride water. Because mercury and sulfur have a, a strong affinity for each other. So, whoops. There we go, we, we, made, a, we made a ketone this way, using an acyl anion equivalent. Okay? All right, so how about, let me show a couple more examples now. Well, actually, let's, so while, while we're here, uh, what, what's the other thing you can do to uh, thioacetals? You can deprotect them, right? But thioacetals also have a different kind of uh, uh, end fate. And that's to we can reduce them. You can deprotect them. You can also reduce them, and that is with H two rainy nickel. It's just a, a alloy of nickel that um, is highly reactive to these sulfur-containing things, and and that will uh, basically just wipe off the thioacetal. You can't do that, also when you look at uh, acetals, the oxygen version, you can't do that with uh, the oxygen versions, okay? You can't do H2 rainy nickel on an on a oxygen-based acetal. Acetal. A-C-E-T-A. -E acetal. So it's really a sulfur thing, okay? All right, so that's cool. Um, what about, uh, here's a question, why why is it kind of acidic? Why is the thioacetal proton kind of acidic? pKa 31 is you know pretty acidic for us, for a, for a, and a CH, and there's no ketone next door or anything. So there must be something stabilizing. What you know? How, why are things acidic? Ah, they're stabilized by the. Uh, uh, the conjugate base is somehow stabilized. Maybe the conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. Remember, that's our universal explanation for acidity. Conjugate, uh, the, the resonance stabilization of the conjugate base, right? 
resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Well, well, let's see how that works here. Resonance stabilization of the conjugate base. Well, why do we have resonance stabilization at that, at that position? So, and it's also weird it, only, it does it for sulfur, but not oxygen, too. Well, why, where's the resonance? I don't see any resonance. There's no double bonds or anything, right? Usually you push towards a double bond. Well, remember, there's something cool about sulfur that it actually can expand its octet. So it can violate the octet rule, right? So this is actually resonance. You can't do that with oxygen. You, you can with uh, sulfur. These are uh, expanded octet. Sulfur can do this. Sulfur can accommodate more than ten, more than eight electrons around it. Okay. Um, what else can we do? Well, we can push the other way. Look at that. So we have these um, res this resonance stabilization of the conjugate base, and that kind of explains why thioacetals are, are, are acidic. Certainly acidic enough that we can take off the proton with a, a pretty strong base like butyl lithium. Okay, all right, that's cool. A couple more examples, and we're done. Let's take this and make, turn it into an acyl anion equivalent. We can't make an acyl anion, but we can make an acyl anion equivalent. So, make a thioacetal. Okay. Rip off the proton. Now you can do all sorts of things with these. I could treat it with an alcohol halide. I could treat it with an aldehyde. Kind of all the stuff you can do with a Grignard and more because remember Grignard, if you make Grignards, you can't, you cannot react Grignards with alkyl halides. You never learned that. But you can react them with aldehydes, you can react them with ketones. Uh, what else can we react with? Epoxides. Those are the main ones we'll, we'll consider. Okay. Sorry, let's zoom out a bit. Okay, and show what these things are. If the thioacetal attacks an alkyl halide, you get I better draw it the other way. If you attack an aldehyde, you make that and of course there's a squiggly line secondary alcohol right if you attack a ketone make a tertiary alcohol There's our squiggly line. So 
So we, we made either a, just a, a new thioacetal towel with an R group on it, or we made a secondary alcohol, or we made a tertiary alcohol. Let's show what happens if you tack the epoxide. Uh, sorry, it's a little congested here. I would draw this out more clearly in your notes. There's the ace line ion attack, and it, it opens up from the left side. So that will look like that kind of thing, right? Okay, so, so alkyl halide, aldehyde, ketone. Here it's attack, uh, attacking an epoxide. I'm only showing the, the attack of the epoxide because it's a little weird and it breaks open to the other side. And it makes this. And where's the squiggly line? Of course, it's right there. All right, there's our squiggly line. Always draw your little squiggly lines. And all of these can either be reduced or deprotected. I'll just show that for these, these two guys. As an example, I'll, I'll reduce one and deprotect the other. Right, I'll, I'll deprotect one and reduce the other. So to deprotect, it's mercury chloride H2O, and that just re returns it back to a ketone. Interestingly, this is an alpha hydroxy ketone. Okay. And then let's, for fun, uh, rather than deprotect this one, let's reduce it. And it's H2, rainy nickel. Okay, so those are those products. This is a, just an alcohol, I guess. All right. This is also kind of cool, cool way uh, to make arbitrary ketones, kind of. Like I said, a cool general way. It's a cool general way to make arbitrary ketones with arbitrary structures. This example. Let's consider making this ketone by kind of just direct construction. We can just kind of envision a squiggly there and a squiggly there. And let's just, let's just, you know, snap the pieces together and just kind of attach an ethyl group on one side and a CH2CH2 phenyl on the other. And the way we can do that is just start with, actually start with this. It's kind of like the thioacetal of formaldehyde. And this happens to be commercially available, so you, you can buy this. Because it does stink a bit. That ethane diethyl stuff is a, a little stinky, so if we can avoid using it, that's ideal. Okay, so what do we do? And we're going to make this ketone up top, so we're going to attach an ethyl, and then we're going to attach a two carbon phenyl thing, so maybe just n butyl lithium, ethyl bromide. And beta lithium, and then the other side says so bromine, two carbons, benzene. Okay. Now I got a new thioacetal. And we could either deprotect or uh, 
could also reduce it if you want. Um, okay, we'll show the mercury chloride deprotection first. Bracket DP bra uh, bracket is an abbreviation for that, and that just gives you. That it's, it's the same thing as above, but it's flipped over. We also do H2 ring nickel. And you know, you, you could say that this is a, a general way to just build all, all sorts of molecules, maybe with a ketone or even a, just an alkane, just by kind of t snapping two things together. And you can imagine that's a very powerful technique. Okay. Um, more practice. I'll let you do these ones. Make that. And you can just envision the squig squigglies right there. That's easy. How about that? How do you make that? Well, you can envision as squigglies, and then sort of build it that way. We'll say uh, more practice. Make from that. So you start with that thing, that thio simple thioacetal, and you can try making these molecules. Okay, and then one more. To practice try making that. And uh, thinking about where the squiggly line is, it's one away from the hydroxy. So is that a ketone, aldehyde, or epoxide? Ketone, aldehyde, or epoxide. Well, if it was a ketone or aldehyde, the hydroxy would be next door. It would be alpha hydroxy. In this case, if it's beta hydroxy, it would be uh, epoxide. So you'd have to think about a, a two-carbon epoxide. I'll, I'll draw what that two-carbon epoxide looks like. Okay. That's it for the course. I think we have about a minute to spare. Um, anyway, so... Yeah, no more lecture. Um, no more lectures. We're done. Um, and I will. I will do a review session type thing. So uh, you can uh, expect that at the end of the week. All right. Cool. And uh, I'll I'll provide more information on I learn. All right. Uh, uh, have a wonderful summer and uh, and check out the information about the final. All right. Take care, guys.